if some Martians were to visit Singapore for the first time, what would their report back to HQ in Mars sound like? Perhaps it would sound a bit like this. Singaporeans are not happy <laughs> that they are not happy. They are ranked 90th only on the Happy Planet Index. They argue whether happiness should replace GTP as the national goal. <clears throat> they have had four decades of extraordinary success economically and socially, and yet they're very insecure about the future. They argue about population and immigration issues. I don't think they'll welcome Martians here. <laughs> and they are lacking in self-confidence. Hmm. So what is happening here? Why are Singaporeans so angry and unhappy and always telling the government what they need to do? This, of course, is a caricature, but I don't think it's far from the truth. Even the founding architect of modern Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, has got some depressing views for us. If you have read his book, Hard Truths to Keep Singapore Going, it can be quite depressing because he talks about the limits of indigenous growth, among other things. He says, Singapore cannot grow global manufacturing champions because of our limited, small talent base. And even if a, if a company becomes successful, it will be gobbled up by a global player. Ultimately, the question is this. How do we see our people in our communities? Do we see it as a glass half empty or half full? I think we have a tendency to see our communities and our people as a glass half empty, and this has got an adverse impact on our self-esteem and self-confidence. And I think there's a danger today of being overly pessimistic. There's a growing distrust between government and the people. From the government's perspective, the people's expectations are unreasonably high, even unfair. From the people's perspective, the government, uh, there's a disconnect and government leaders need to be more understanding and empathetic. I think we need a much more positive narrative that is founded on optimism and belief in our people. We must see the glass as half and full. Half full. And yes, there are, op there are challenges. We have deficiencies and needs. But there are opportunities. There are possibilities in everything that we do and everything around us. Look at the growing and the rising social consciousness and political awareness, the rising volunteerism and philanthropy and the emerging energy from the ground. These are opportunities. And we need to have that positive narrative to drive us forward. Lots of studies have shown the effects of positive encouragement and positive interactions on the people, and this is one of them. Some of you may have read this popular book called How Full Is Your Bucket? by Tom Rath and Donald Clifton. And in this book, they talk about an experiment by a Dr. Elizabeth Herlock. What she did was to study the effect of praise or the lack of it on children, on students in the fourth and sixth grade math class. So there were three groups. One was praised for the good work, one criticized for the poor work, and another completely ignored. By the fifth day, these are the results. We, she saw 71% improvement in the group that was praised, 19% in the group that was criticized, and 5% for the group that was ignored. We must invest in more positive encouragements and in being positive to the people around us. But are we doing it with our family, with our, at our workplace, in our community? What are we doing with our children? Are we praising them more than we are scolding them? Are we commending our co-workers more than we criticize them? Are we offering more constructive comments rather than complaining? 
And how do we treat frontline service staff? I think as a society, as a people, we need to invest more in appreciation, graciousness, and recognition. And more than praise is belief in our students. Now here, this is an example of an experiment in Singapore. And here is an experiment to see how we can, how we can turn a classroom. Here is a normal tech class full of students who hate math. I don't know what's this thing about math, but it's, somehow it, it gets us, uh, uh, that we have issues with it. A normal tech class of students who hate math. And, uh, and this is in the secondary school. And the experiment was from just January this year, so we have only had four months of it. So what was done was to cluster the students. They were paired up. They were taught to teach each other and encouraged and empowered to do so. What happened after three months? Uh, astounding results. You may ask, how is this possible? How can you let students teach themselves when the teachers can't do anything better? And yet, in three months, there was one test where the students who were taught, uh, solely self-taught through this tutorial method scored better than the students who were solely teacher-taught. How is this possible? I, I don't know Mr. Sugata Mitra, <laughs> but I think he's very familiar to me because it is through encouragement and belief, belief in the strengths and ability of every student and believing that when we put the joy and responsibility of learning in their hands, they can do wonders, they can unlock their own strengths and abilities. But first, we must believe in them and give them a chance. But in Singapore, do we believe in our people? Do we see the fullness in each one of us and empower them? There seems to be quite a bit of fear. Fear from government that if we give power to the people, somehow it will be misused or unused and fear as a people of messiness and inefficiencies and, and a lack of tolerance for that. But I don't think we have any choice. For us to progress as a nation, we have to put the work back and the power back to the people to take control of their lives. Let's look at the word empower. What does it mean? If you look at the word power, if you, I, I dug up, dug up the American Heritage Dictionary, the first definition of empower, of power, is the act or capacity, the ability or capacity to act and do something effectively. So empower in our context, what does it mean? It means to equip our citizens with the power, with the ability, capacity to create their own futures and to deal with on-the-ground issues on a day-to-day basis that affects their everyday life. We have to believe that in putting the power back in the people, that citizens can do much more good, and that will far outweigh the negatives. Let me illustrate with an example. And I have to credit this illustration to Mr. Liat Tinglet from Kutik Pot Hospital. Let's say you have bought yourself a mug from a departmental store, which is represented by the mug on the left. And you go home and you see that there is a chip in it. You'll be pretty angry, won't you? You'll say, why didn't the store have better quality control? You'll march straight back to the store, demand either a refund or an exchange for a more perfect mug. But let's say instead you attended a pottery class and you made a mug, which is, which is represented by the mug on your right. And it's not particularly attractive, even ugly, but you feel attached to it. You use it, you show it to your friends, even if they go, hmm, well, why is he showing it to me? You have a personal attachment to it. 
What is the difference here? On the left, you are investing just in hardware, and on the right, you are investing in software. Because when you're buying something, when something is done for you, you're only judging it by the appearance and the utility. But when you're doing something for yourself, you're judging it differently. You're judging it by your sweat and your tears that you put into it, into learning and, 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 and making it. You're judging it by your emotions and your memories. And so, when we built beautiful flats you know, in our HDB estates, and you've spent a fortune renovating it, that's only hardware. It doesn't make a home. Or we built a country that's impressive, that is a city in a garden. That's only hardware because we know that it is software that matters at the end of the day. There is no soul in things that are done for you, only in the things that you do for yourself. And we need to step forward to lead. Each one of us is a leader. I don't believe that leaders are born. And you need authority or permission from anyone to do anything. Anyone can start any simple initiative like this one. And when they start, they can fly. This, is, this example is Choke Food for the Needy, which was just launched 1st April. This face, Facebook page was launched on 1st April this month, just three weeks ago. And how a simple idea, which if you are not familiar with this, is a movement to pass on extra cash to hawkers, who will then sponsor free meals for the disadvantage in our midst. Or you've heard of other examples as well. You'll be familiar with Singaporean of the day, which are stories of how ordinary Singaporeans are doing extraordinary things to enliven in our neighborhood. Leadership is for all of us and for us, all of us to take ownership of our community. But a lot of us still are holding back. I sense more are coming forward, but many are still holding back. So, please, step up to the plate. But you might ask, what are you stepping up to? What is the future for Singapore? I would share with you my future, my dreams. I see a Singapore where our pledge is more than aspirational. It is truly lived. I see a Singapore where together we are building an ideal type of society beyond the material, where the underlying philosophy is that every one of us has some fullness and that no potential is discounted. I see a Singapore where we value social justice, compassion, equal dignity for everybody, where people are the ends and not the means. I see Singapore where there are few NIMBY issues, there are only PIMBY issues. Please put it in my backyard. Where we learn to live with diversity and embrace it and respect one another and solve problems together for the common good, even when things don't always go our way. And above all, I see a Singapore where giving is a way of life, where citizens and the civil society is thriving to develop the soul of the nation. That is what I see. But this requires change. Change in all of us. And change can be very tough. We need moral courage. Courage to walk down a path that is less well-trodden. Courage to confront our fears in the face of naysayers and unfriendly people. And courage to continue walking and to believe in ourselves, even when we, when we turn around and find that no one is following us. So what are your aspirations and dreams? What are your fears and anxieties? What is holding you back? Well, we are, I like this cat. 
Okay, it's got an attitude. I love this picture. <laughs> but we are different from animals. We have a spiritual soul, and the chief faculties of the soul is the intellect, which knows, and the will, which loves. When you put the intellect and the will together, you have something powerful that can help us have moral courage and to make tough choices. What do you choose for yourself today? Let me suggest. Please choose to be the change you wish to see in the world. And please act like we believe we can change Singapore. Thank you, and God bless. Mm.